Hello to students and teachers and all Americans who may be watching and even some of uh, those of you outside of America who may be watching and are interested in the Constitution of American life and uh, politics, American history, uh, and anything that relates to uh, how we try to survive as a nation from day to day. Last week, uh, or last session, uh, we talked about American federalism, uh, focusing on a quote by John Adams, uh, who I've suddenly developed some respect for, given his <laughs> view of American federalism. And there's a bridge from last session to this session in that we are going to be looking at federalism and the American and American elections, voting rights, and uh, how it either federalism either you know complicates or you know in, you know, expands uh, uh, voting participation, expands the, uh, the the sovereignty of the people, or uh, complicates and uh, creates uh, uh, problems there. So as I said in our last session, uh, we did talk about American uh, federalism. And I do want to refer to a previous episode that we did, uh, I think over the summer on voting rights and, and some of the things for students to think about uh, here and to remind you of is voting a constitutional right or a privilege? Who has the final authority to determine voting rights? Does the federal system promote or deter fair and free election? These are just a few of the questions that are part of the current national conversation on voting and elections. If we look at what uh, students you have to uh, deal with, uh, for those of you in the We the People program, uh, you have to deal with Federalist 59 and a quote by uh, Publius uh, here. Nothing can be more evident than that, than that, sorry, an exclusive power of regulating elections for the national government in the hands of the state legislatures would leave the existence of the union entirely at their mercy. Which causes a major problem, at least as we see it today, in how we handle elections and this question of fair and free uh, 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 determination of who our elected representatives would be. I want to refer to the Brennan Center uh, on elections and voting because I think they're one of the best sites to go to to find information, data, and things. And so let's kind of talk about the current state, or let's refer to the current state which the question obviously wants us to get to. Between January 1st and July 1st of this year, 17 states enacted 28 new laws that restrict access to the vote. The United States is on track to far exceed its most recent period of significant voter suppression, 2011. By October of that year, 19 restrictive laws were enacted in 14 states. This year, the country has already reached that level and it's only, or well, it, it, this was only uh, July 1st. More restrictions on the vote are likely to become law as roughly, roughly one third of the legislatures are still in session. Indeed, at least 61 bills with restrictive prov provisions are moving through 18 state legislatures. Nationwide, uh, there is a nationwide effort to expand the powers uh, of poll watchers. That's one of the elements here a move that invites uh, the opportunity for increased voter intimidation and harassment at the polls. Three states have passed such laws, as well as laws to punish local election officials for technical mistakes and laws to impose criminal penalties on election officials. Six laws in, uh, in, in uh, about 12, or two, six laws in four states shorten the time frame for voters to request a mail ballot including a Georgia law that will re reduce that window by more than one half. Five laws in four states make it more difficult, or five laws in five states, sorry, make it more difficult for voters to automatically receive their ballot or ballot application, either by making it harder to stay on absentee voting lists or by prohibiting voting officials from sending applications or ballots without the voters' affirmative requests. Nine laws in eight states make it more difficult for voters to deliver their mail ballots, including a law in Arkansas that makes the in-person ballot delivery deadline easier, or excuse me, earlier. Six laws that restrict assistance to voters in, re uh, in returning their mail ballots, and four laws that limit the availability of mail ballot drop boxes. Three laws in three states impose stricter signature requirements for mail voting, while other Three others impose stricter or new voter ID 
uh, for mail voting. So that's some of the data there from the Brennan Center. I suggest to all students and teachers that you use that site if uh, I'm beyond this topic, but especially on this topic. So I'd like gentlemen to revisit a previous episode and just get your quick thoughts here. Is voting a right or a privilege? Professor Moore? Well, there's nothing, there's nothing textual. Uh, uh, it, it's an inference that it's a right, uh, but there's nothing affirmatively stated that it is. Um, that, that's, that's, yeah, that's, that's what I would say. Enough. Gentlemen, anything to add to that? Uh, uh, well, I, I don't, I think it is a right because the Constitution calls it a right, but it doesn't say it's a positive right. So I think there's, I, 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 I'm not meaning to split hairs, but if you look at when it, it alludes to it, talking about the right to vote cannot be denied. So the term right to vote is in the Constitution, I do believe, but it doesn't come across as a positive right in terms of that you have a right to vote. So your, your right to vote cannot be denied based upon your gender, based on your ethnicity or other issues, right? Professor Williams? Yeah, I would say historically, it's it has not been a right to echo what Chris is saying. I mean, even even what we have in the in the Fifteenth Amendment, it's it's not a, a right as a human being, right? It's it's based on um, you can't be denied the right based on certain things. And and I like to play around with this idea of privilege, you know, especially given the time we're living in. Um, yeah, voting has been considered a privilege for most of our history, and it's been the privilege of white male property owned people. Like it's, it has been the um, the hallmark of what it means to have white privilege in the United States is the ability to vote historically. So why do you think, Professor Williams, that we've become enamored, and even you know, uh, even those of us in the field of civic education, you know, like to talk about the right to vote, the cherished fundamental right to vote? I believe one Supreme Court justice. How did how did that, in your opinion, develop? How did we get? Is that just part of American exceptionalism? You know our 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 uh, our, our frequent uh, desire to lie to ourselves. I mean, why do we call it a fundamental right? And again, the court at various points has called it a fundamental right. Well, but let it me... seems like the consensus here is well, it's neither enumerated. Yeah, right. Yeah. And as you say, it's more of a privilege. It's 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 um. Let me let me kind of just go through kind of a discussion I had with my students last week in a comparative politics class. We're talking about the difference between power and authority. And power is the ability of some entity to get you to do something you wouldn't rather do. Authority is when you do it because you think that that entity has legitimacy. So we're talking about why we stop at stop signs. You know, is it just because we're afraid we're going to get caught? Or is it because we actually go through the logic of thinking, well, there's some local representative who has authority to put a stop sign there. And I may not agree with it, but I live in a democracy and I can vote that person out of office and get a stop sign put someplace else if I want, right? So Voting is, at our basic logic, what makes our system an authority rather than just a, a power. And once we, once you start denying that or thinking or, or, or trying to poke holes in that, the whole system kind of can come down pretty quickly. So I, I think we go to great lengths to legitimate our democratic system to then legitimate that we have this history that voting is a fundamental right. And of course, it hasn't always been perfect, but we've been getting better. I just think it's it's essential to keep the whole system sort of seeming legitimate. And I'm sure we're gonna go into it the next hour about the challenges we've had as a country um, to make that actually a reality more than more than a myth. So any of you take exception or have a problem with the quote that, uh... Uh, I read and that students have to deal with by Publius? Well, I don't necessarily, um, but I know that Cato did. Uh, for, I mean, students that are paying attention to this, uh, I think it's Cato 7, um, that uh, he, he rips on this. You know, he has a whole paragraph within that document to um, counteract this problem that he sees within the Constitution. So, um, you know, I, you know, do I have a, do I personally have a problem with the quote? Mm, I mean, the way things have played out, not really, but I know there are people that have been, and starting from the very beginning, I, uh, for the students to go to Cato 7.
Tim, Mike, you guys have a problem with the quote? No, uh, but I uh, maybe just a, a little context. I mean, the reason um, the reason Article One, Section Four is there is because um, states weren't doing the right thing during the 1780s. Uh, I mean, in a way, the states kind of held um, the Articles Congress hostage. Uh, sometimes they wouldn't have elections. Uh, so there wouldn't be any, uh, there wouldn't be any delegates. I mean, the Articles Congress had a constant uh, problem of quorums. They didn't have enough people there to actually do business. Now that's right at the doorstep uh, of the states. The, the states could choke off the national legislature. Um, and so, the, I mean, the whole reason that we have that there is that the new constitution says you are not going to hold this, this proposed national government hostage the way you've been holding the Articles Congress hostage. If you don't have elections or you monkey around with elections, um, we can be the ultimate um, uh, authority or maybe power, <laughs> to Mike's point. Now, the anti-federalists saw it as power. Uh, but the whole, the whole, the whole reason it's there is the chicanery of the states during the 1780s. Yeah, and I would say that that plays out at obviously at other times in our history too, right? Oh. Where states have just kind of said to the federal government, you know, um, no, I mean, different than we're not going to show up for quorum, <laughs> but we're not going to enforce your federal law with right. respect to discrimination. We're not going to, we're not, we're just not going to do it, and come force us, right? Um, which then turns the democratic system into one that looks a little more authoritarian because you have to send in the army or the national guard to enforce a, a federal order at the state level. So I, I, I'm curious then, and I guess we'll put it on a scale of a, a grade, A, B, C, D, of course we give no Fs because uh, we're all liberal fuzzy heads uh, here. What grade would you guys give the national government in regards to promoting and protecting against fraud and elections and, and, and protecting voting rights. And, and let's let's give this kind of parameters before Shelby, because we want to talk about after the Shelby decision there. But before Shelby, uh, based upon you know the fact that Tim, as you said, the national government, that is, they do address this concern by Publius, uh, or or you know, they 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 did address that in the constitution by giving Congress or the national government authority over elections. How well do you think they had, they did historically up until Shelby? Well, if you pay, if you, if you look and Chris mentioned uh, the Cato piece, but I mean, Luther Martin, uh, uh, there's an essay, great essay, uh, Cornelius uh, Vox Populi, uh, Federal Farmer even has a couple of sections you know, and it's the, the argument is essentially a chicken little argument as I listen to the anti federalists on this. This is the end of the world. This this abusive, consolidated, powerful government is just going to run roughshod over the states. In fact, this this clause was amongst the most visceral, viscerally responded to by the anti federalists of, of all the powers in the Constitution. Really this generated a lot of ink, much more so than I thought when I first uh, started uh, in my current uh, employment. So if you look at the anti-federalists, they, they are painting the end of the world with this power. So if you take them seriously and you look at our history, the federal government's been an abysmal failure to step in and do that power that they feared so much. Uh, I mean, there's been these punctuated moments. Uh, most notably, I think we're probably going to get to 1965 here if, Mark, if Mike's in the uh, if Mike's in the discussion. But if you if you if you take the anti-federalists seriously, it's been an abysmal failure of the federal government stepping in. Mike, what are your thoughts? What, what grade he gave them an F, and that's that's okay because. Yes. I know he's not with well D minus D minus D, yeah okay D minus uh and, and I'm yeah. curious is is Tim right that up until 1964-65 they they really are a dismal failure other what well, you know I guess other than amendments I mean you do have amendments uh uh, uh Tim that would you right. might argue that are the way for the 
the national government. Well, so, yeah, to... and the Reconstruction South, I mean, there was a, this brief moment uh, of expansion of voting, sure. But, but uh, Mike, on the whole. Yeah, so Mike, what, you know, if Tim does a D minus, what's your grade and reasoning behind the grade for the national government's role in elections? Well, uh, the difference between like uh, Wisconsin, which is a research institute, and USD, which is more of a liberal arts teaching institution, is that um, um, I, I would be more generous. Um, <laughs> I would, I, this is going to be very generous of me. I would give um, the federal government an incomplete on this because, um, and it's going to be very, very generous <laughs> because I think that. Um, well played. It, yeah, thank you. I've been thinking that out the last five minutes. I think that um, if, you, if you take from the standpoint that we have actually been a liberal democracy since 1965, starting with Congress's act, right? Um, and then we think about, well, in the 1970s, they tried to regulate money. They've, they've, they've tried to do some things. 1993, National Voter Registration Act. There's an act, um, 2002. They're doing more the last 50 years than they had done previously. but as to Tim's point, before that, they've done probably nothing. I, I, I didn't look it up. I mean, you look online, like the big acts, national laws. Well, Congress said there's going to be one day, one national day of voting for Congress. That was that was important. And um, they haven't allowed states to have at large representation. Like they've, they've made them have single member districts. Um, be, before you get to the 1965 Civil Rights Act, those are the the two major stances the federal government has, has taken, and and I don't I don't think that that's that's a lot. Chris, um, we I'm got gonna, an incomplete and we got a D minus. Where are you at? Well, I, gosh, you know, if it's pre sixty five, I'm giving them an F. If it's post sixty five, maybe a D plus, D as in David, right? Not as in B as in boy. Um, I think they've been abysmal. I mean, I would go to uh, the 14th Amendment, the second clause of the 14th Amendment, with the voting rights that are in there, as my as to go back and take a look, because you have the 14th Amendment ratified in 1868. And for students, I encourage them to look at uh, Section 2, which establishes voting rights for African American males that age 21 and over. At least that's the attempt of the framers of the 14th Amendment. And never was that clause used to take away representation from people that were keeping people from voting that were, they were supposed to. So when you, we get into the Reconstruction era in the Southern states, especially, um, you know, the federal government had the power to rescind representation uh, based upon the percentage of people that African-American men that Southern states kept from voting, and it was never used. So therein lies my frustration. As a matter of fact, I think some scholars, I, th I think I heard Amar say this, that the 15th Amendment itself was superfluous if the 14th Amendment had simply been enforced, right? And But then again, if you look at the, the 15th Amendment, um, look in the, for the students, I would tell you to look at uh, U.S. v. Reese, uh, 1875, and there in the Supreme Court says in its opinion that there is not a positive right to vote within the Constitution. You're, you know, so I would say it's it's pretty it's pretty weak. Um, I would also though then take a maybe look at the Warren Court and the redistricting cases. Uh, you know, and, and I think those were fairly solid in terms of trying to grant a greater equality within state legislatures. Those were somewhat revolutionary, those decisions, whether Baker v. Carr, Reynolds v. Sims, Westbury v. Westbury v. Sanders, and you look at those redistricting cases, I think at the state level, those are those are pretty good. But again, those are post, you know, those are post-65. So pre-65, I'm 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 uh, I may be a fuzzy headed liberal at times, but that's an F. You know, it's just well, no, you 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 switched the time frame. I said pre-Shelby. Uh you moved it back to pre uh uh, you know, 60s, uh, and uh, I wish I had, I wish I was still teaching, I could show this to my students and tell them I'm not the toughest grader they've ever uh, seen, because I'd probably give a C minus, because I do believe that the national government has a major role to play in the 14th, in the 15th, oh, in I, the 19th, yeah, I, and, I, and therefore they've got to be given some credit. Well, no, the, the, the case, so what do you give to people, a grade to people when they have a role to play, but they don't? 
Well, and they, they have do, the power, because, but they don't use it. No, well, because, again, no, you know very well that post, you know, post Fifteenth Amendment, that the national government does attempt. All right, and and again, you know, going back to our last session, you talked about the push and pull that's a constant in in the American constitutional uh, system. There was, I think, a valiant attempt, which unfortunately was not necessarily supported by the majority of the American people. And that's why in 1877, the national government kind of backed away uh, from that. And then we see very little in action. And I think this has a lot to do uh, with the fact that, you know, one, historically, we see that, you know, even though Publius may have a problem with this, the American people see voting rights and elections as a state function historically, and therefore it becomes part of our cultural norm. And that is still the true today, is you try to suggest national reform on elections and voting rights, right? You, you get a lot of pushback by, well, that should be taken care of by states and, 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 and uh, in, in regards to elections and things like that. And the fact that, that voting is not a positive right. Therefore, some will argue that uh, Congress doesn't have the authority to go out there and do that. And, and that becomes a, a post-World War II. So, you know, my point is, 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 again, I very much appreciate, you know, although I think Professor Williams representing a, a uh, private liberal arts school uh, does so well by saying, I'll give you an incomplete and you can finish this by the time you're 28 uh, and we'll still give you a degree uh, there. And thank you for your $400,000 worth of tuition. Uh, uh, there. Uh, so, uh, what I'm, I'm well, Dave, sure. Dave, Dave, I get, I can't, I can't, I, I mean, that's of course funny. You can. that's really funny. But I got to go back to something. Sorry. I mean, um, the 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 golden era, you know, post Civil War, was only made possible by the Union armies being in the South, and you know this. So when we get to the the Hayes Tilden debacle or deal that establishes, you know, uh, probably one of them, I don't want to say, I don't want to call it a corrupt election, but certainly a bargained election, uh, which establishes home rule then for Southern states, those, those, that brief small window of opportunity that we had, you know, during reconstruction is gone, it went by the wayside. So yeah, that, that military's there at the, you know, at, because of orders from the executive branch supported by, you know, by Congress. Right. And I think they have to be given some credit in their attempt to yeah. try to enforce. The well, let's system. let's not uh, let's not make Grant virtuous here. I mean, they 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 have a whole new constituency of voters if they go down and enforce it. Uh, so so there's there's some duplicity duplicity there. I, yeah. uh, and I and I and I would add that the enforcement acts, which come from the fact that the Fourteenth Amendment. The 15th allowed Congress to enforce laws, right? Yeah. Which, as as Chris has already pointed out, you know, Cruikshank and Reese sort of like gut them. But by 1894, Congress just simply repealed them. <laughs> I mean, Congress just kind of said, "Okay, we're done with trying to enforce these amendments." So, um, yeah, I, I think it was I think it was not the best effort. Well, back to being practical politicians, I I would imagine. Uh, I am curious, and I know. Professor Morris driving nuts, but we we got to get into this uh, into this uh, realm here, and that is the notion of voter fraud. Do you guys think that voter fraud is a serious is such a serious problem that it has to be dealt with uh, nationally? Uh, because you know that seems to be the trigger uh, for what we're dealing with contemporarily, as far as legislation around the nation and some of the data that I shared in the beginning uh, there and. Professor Moore, you can kind of maybe help us with some historical perspective. That is, as voter fraud, you know, is it is it stayed static throughout history? Is it greater now than it was in the 18th and 19th century? Lesser now than it was? Uh, uh, so I'm curious, what's your thoughts about that, about voter fraud? Well, uh, voter fraud has always been with us. Uh, the question is uh, how much which I don't know, I don't know that um, anybody but God himself uh, or herself uh, would be able to uh, divine <laughs> how much voter fraud there is. I mean, uh, all, all I can tell you is in the ratification era, there was all kinds of monkey business going on 
um, both for regular elections as well as um, you know the choosing of candidates for their conventions. Uh, North Carolina was a debacle. Um, so yeah, there, there's there's always been the issue of voter fraud, um, even even at our our virtuous founding period. However, back to your point, how much? And right. I mean, and I would I would venture to guess it was probably way easier in the 18th century and early 19th century to swing elections well, through that. Uh, but. Yeah. Delaware, um, in the ratification era, Delaware, we don't, there's very little information about uh, the substance of the debates in Delaware about the Constitution. But what we do have during the ratification debate era in Delaware is there was just absolute chicanery violence. I mean, people got beat up at the polls uh, during that window of time in Delaware. I mean, it was ugly. Uh, it just, I mean, we talk about intimidation now. Uh, okay, <laughs> getting your head clubbed in. Um, I mean, it was just all over Delaware. And like I said, North Carolina as well. Professor Williams? Yeah, I don't know. The, the, the research I found looking at over this this weekend is that one um, scholar has, has done as much research as can be done on this. It's hard to find you know, the, the non-barking dog, but um, um, 30 <laughs> out of 1 billion, 1 billion votes from 2000 to 2014, um, the scholar found 31 cases of documented voter fraud. So I think Tim's absolutely right. I think that it's, it's a fascinating question, I think, for students to think about in terms of just um, political culture at the founding and how there was violence and there was fraud and there was paying people off and and how we, we, we reformed our, a lot of our ways, like we, we adopted the Australian voting ballot as a way to sort of give voters more secrecy and privacy so they wouldn't be um, um, influenced by politicians. But in recent years of all the issues that America faces, and we face a lot, um, voter fraud does not seem to be one that when scholars look at it, they think is a, is a problem that deserves all the attention that Dave pointed out from the very beginning, all of this, energy and resources at the state level and at the federal level to talk about voter fraud doesn't seem to to match up with what we actually know is happening you just look at the numbers in terms of turnout for americans in elections if we're that concerned about voter fraud right i mean maybe we should be more concerned about you know just participation in general yeah. and not fraudulent participation I, i'm listening to you mike and i'm sorry i'm like I don't know if you guys are familiar with the movie uh, Breakfast Club and Anthony Michael Hall's character has the fake ID. And you go, why do you have a fake ID? Because they think it's to buy booze. And he goes, so I can vote, of course. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I just want to add something else. I, I just, I want to make sure I say is that um, even though, even though there's a lot of evidence that this is not an issue, it, the fact that it is now in our political discourse that um, I don't think President Trump, former President Trump started it, but he definitely made it mainstream. And now you hear that this is part of um, a political party strategy to talk, start talking about voter fraud before votes are cast, right? Once that becomes part of your political discourse, the legitimacy of the system is threatened. And the fact that this last week that Arizona, Republican-led Arizona came out and said, you know what? We've, we've, we've done our own, we've recounted, there was no voter fraud, right? After all this time, that does not matter in a political discourse where it is now perfectly within what is thinkable for politicians to claim voter fraud without any proof. And, and that is something that studying comparative politics and studying history, we know that happens in places that are not respecting their democracies or their rule of law. And it's usually, um, you know, not soon after this sort of political discourse that you actually see real threats to the political system. So I, I think it's something that we should be super, super concerned about, not because of whether there's voter fraud or not, but just the way that political elites these days are using it um, to get people to, to pass laws and to vote. Well, you know, and it's interesting because some of us did our homework uh, uh, here uh, before uh, this session. And I went to the Heritage Foundation, 
I thought, okay, I'll go right of center here and see what they what they have uh, to say about it. And one of the things I found is that they were able to show 96 cases of fraud. Now, this was something they released in 2018, but it, it, it encompassed the previous 15 years. So they found 96 cases of fraud in various types. They categorize it in their, in their study, but that's out of 50 million voters you know, uh, at the time. And so you look at the percentage and you go, does this rise to the level of a national concern, let alone a local concern, if those numbers are in the realm of possible? So I drew the line earlier uh, to Shelby and uh, Professor Kavanaugh kind of changed that line. So I am curious, Mr. Kavanaugh, uh, and there's kind of two things. The Voting Rights Act is uh, is passed in 1965. Mm -hmm. What does the Voting Rights Act do, in your opinion? And what are the key core elements to that? And so, if we go from the Voting Rights Act of of 1965 up until Shelby, what grade do you give the national government? Well, certainly, probably moving the C plus B minus range. <laughs> You're harsh. Well, I mean, why not treat all of your citizens equally? Why allow states to treat members of that are American citizens as well as state citizens? Why allow them to treat them unequally? But where, where, in, where, where in the statutes of of the national government, Congress, actions by the president's uh, uh, the Supreme Court decisions up until Shelby, this is where I guess you're confusing me. You know, remember Eisenhower's favorite, you know, famous quote, you know, laws do not change the hearts and minds of people. So Congress is passes, passing laws and Mike has articulated, you know, the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. You know, in fact, this, the Voting Rights Act has reaffirmed and expanded the 60s, the 70s, 80s, 90s, right. even in the early 2000s. So the season David. the national government is doing a very good job of trying to live up to the standard of the Voting Rights Act, but that doesn't mean that the American people buy in. Well, David, if, if that was the case, we wouldn't be having this discussion right now. If the national government had done its job- No, 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 Shelby. Well, I mean, the idea of you know getting rid of the pre-clearance as Shelby County does, right? Shelby County Beholder for the students watching because uh, of realizing that not all students know this case yet, but you will, you, you definitely need to take a look at it. Shelby County versus Holder, um, you have a, the 1965 Voting Rights Act has been re-up by Congress without hardly any, you know, pushback. It's almost been unanimous every time it's been re-up by Congress, and it was re-upped, I think, in 2000. Oh gosh, guys, 2001, something like that. Not a few during years, the Bush administration. Yeah, you know, um, pardon me. Uh, prior to a few years prior to Shelby County v. Holder, and so you know, that's of the pre-clearance and, and justice. Chief Justice Roberts, in his opinion, and the idea that well. We're a post-racial society, so we don't have these problems anymore. So the pre-clearance part of, of uh, the Voting Rights Act is pulled out in that case, which really is the key card in this, and it allows immediately, immediately after that decision comes down, you see states start to pass stricter voting rights requirements. And okay, so if I can check in, Chris, because that was my first question is, so pre-clearance is part of what you would consider the one of the core elements of the Voting Rights Act. Could you well, explain for our audience what that means? What pre-clearance? Sure, means? sure. And what part of that of the the um, uh, the Voting Rights Act of '65 is the idea? What uh, you have places in the country that traditionally uh, limited people's access to the polls, and so if you if you're one of these places. Uh, and I'll just say it primarily Southern states because of Jim Crow laws. Uh, if you're one of these places that had traditionally restricted access to the polls, if you want to change after the Voting Rights Act of 65, if you want to change how you're going to do your elections, you've got to come to the federal government first and you got to get their blessing. You got to say, we're changing this because of X, Y, Z. This is why we're making the change to the law. And then the federal government will give its blessing or not. When you take that away, then that allows places, even not, and not just the Southern states, I think one of the first states to pass a law after post Shelby was Pennsylvania. 
uh, to restrict access to the polls. So, I mean, that's the, the pre-clearance part of that in terms of uh, taking that power away, uh, kind of open the floodgate. Mike, I'm sorry, go ahead, Mike. You're, you're not putting it in here. Ooh, ooh, ooh. No. Well, I'm, I'm, well, Mike, I'm gonna I'm gonna lead into you to feed off of that because, and again, what I'm trying, I, what I want students to think about this because we can never think about this in its totality of American history, uh, whether we were going to call them stages, phases, periods, or whatever. Voting rights has again phases, stages, whatever we want to talk about there. So if we go from the Voting Rights Act up until Shelby, all right, so let's draw a line there, because we know that post Shelby, as you referred to, Professor Kavanaugh, we're in a whole different world. But from 65 until Shelby, Professor Williams, so two parts, beyond preclearance, is there any other core element of the Voting Rights Act that you think kids and, and teachers should know about and secondly, what grade would you give the national government in that, what is that, 35 years or so of, of our history uh, as far as the national government dealing with elections and voting rights? Professor Williams. Okay, from the from 65 to Shelby, what grade would I give? Um, probably a B. I, I, I mean, I kind of agree with you, David, I guess, I, I, up to that point. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, but what I want to, <laughs> what's frustrating about all this is that the Constitution gives Congress the power at any time, like, like, like what, what, and I'll get to the other question, but what Chris just described with preclearance, right? Preclearance is um, if you had any tests or if less than 50% of the registered voters voted in the presidential election of 64, you, you had to get preclearance by the federal government to, to check on you, make sure you weren't discriminating. Why were those? two rules there? Well, because Johnson's trying to put together a majority for this, right? It probably should have even been a wider scope. I mean, my question is, why isn't Congress routinely checking in with states and local governments to make sure that what they're doing is not discriminating? Like, why isn't that just part of our system, given our history of racism and given our history of, of what we know has been voter fraud? So that's, that's part of my issue there. So I'd give it a B. And then the other part of your question is, um, section two of the Voting Rights Act gave um, Congress just a wider authority to make sure that states weren't doing things that were gonna have a discriminatory impact, right? And um, so with the combination of the Shelby case and then the, is it the, the Bronovich case, um, Bronovich got rid of section two pretty much, um, Shelby, What's frustrating about Shelby, then I'm going to, then I'll be quiet. What's frustrating about Shelby is that what the court said, I know Roberts had his rhetoric in there, but they basically said the Congress, they said, Congress, you haven't updated the formula since, since, since 1975. What should the formula be for preclearance? Congress cannot decide, cannot get together and do it because Republicans are blocking that from happening. I mean, all the Congress has to do is, is say, this is what the formula should be. And Shelby, you could get around Shelby, but that doesn't happen because of our partisan politics. So what's happened is that this, this super important piece of legislation, right, of which I just want students to just realize we, we do a lot of, uh, we should be talking a lot about our patriots, those who are doing a lot overseas to protect freedom, right? The Voting Rights Act was passed at the end of the day because American citizens, a majority of them black American citizens, risk their lives and risk their bottle, their bodies to give the political motion, right? It, it, it was two days after or a week after John Lewis got his head beat in that Johnson finally said, we're gonna do this when Johnson had been talking about it for a year, right? The needing this act. So this is something that was only passed by the blood of American citizens. And the fact that now we're just kind of letting it all kind of fall away and all this infrastructure go away um, is, is just, it's, it's, really, it's really sad. It's really, really sad. Sorry, that wasn't eloquent, but that's where I'm gonna stop. Professor Moore, you've, uh, you've, you've had, you know, it's, it's been fun watching you and the uh, squares because uh, you're about as far removed from presentism as, as one can be. <laughs> yeah. uh, there, I, so, but, 
I, I have very that little. You have... Yeah, I have very little con to contribute here. Um, I mean, it is amazing to me that the boogeyman. Uh, you, you know, I, I see Shelby as I see many things. Um, as the culmination of some of this vitriolic anti-federalist fear uh, that, uh, you know, the, the federal government is, uh, I think Luther Martin said, if this claw, if we pass this constitution, this, this alone will lead to the annihilation of states. Uh, and Patrick Henry said similar things in the Virginia uh, legislature, uh, in the Virginia ratification convention as well. So th the fact that, uh, the preclearance is gone, I think, in, in many ways, is a tip of the hat to the old Federalist rhetoric of we don't want this intrusive boogeyman government controlling the states. And the, the text of the Constitution is clearly stated that they can do this. There's textual base. I mean, I find it ironic that there's, there's a pretty clear textual basis for the federal government to step in. Uh, and <laughs> and they, they haven't. Well, then, uh, then you have to ask a question, why is that? And Mike made the same point. So they yeah. have, Congress has the power to do this, but they've refused, not entirely all of Congress, but much of Congress has, re about half of the Senate, we'll put it well, that way. A lot of the discussion at the founding period is, no, this will only happen in ex the most extreme, extraordinary circumstances. Uh, that came up a lot in the in the Federalist defense of this. This this won't need be needed. It's only in the most extreme, you know, like invasion. Uh, invasion was in the phrasing. Uh, disability of the of uh, you know. So so the the Federalists in a way paint this really high bar that it would very rarely be needed. Now, whether they're responding to the hyperbole of the anti-federalist about how draconian this was, I, I mean, I think there's something to that as well. But th in a sense, the federalists at the founding create such a high bar so as to preclude much activity on this on this clause, I think. So, Chris, what do you think is is at the core? So let's get into the most present. Uh, what do you think is at the core, you know, Shelby, post Shelby, I hate to give you parameters here, but uh, that's what I do. What's at the core of, of this debate over election law and voting rights? Why do you think this has emerged uh, in our elderly years? Well, I'll, I'll speak as a historian. I think it's all about race. I really do. I think race is still at the fundamental issue here. Wow. Okay. Now, now I'll, I'll let the people that actually know about what's going on, I'll let them weigh in. But I, I think you can't discount race. I, yeah. I, I agree. I mean, I agree with Tim. I think so much of it is, is, uh, has become racially motivated, but it's also power motivated because, and I'm gonna say this, on, and for the people that are watching this, I'm gonna be really political here for a few minutes. So I, even though I try to, obviously it's, sometimes it's pretty obvious which way my twig is bent, but, um, what you start to see at the state level is people without ideas, right, worried about losing power, trying to limit the access of people that look differently than them or think differently from them because they can't appeal to people based upon the ideas that they have to sell. And I don't say have to sell, but in terms of like, these are our plans, this is our platform. That, you know, we, we have this as a party, so come vote for us because these are our, uh, uh, this is our agenda, right? My goodness, we had a, a last presidential administration that didn't even have an agenda. So now you, what you start to see at state levels it, are people starting to limit access to the polls because they can't win elections without doing that. Do you think that means gerrymandering is a, I guess I can't help but think that maybe gerrymandering is a bigger problem. It, gerrymandering than, is a huge than issue. Ballot, ballot access. I yeah, mean, because, I, it, well, I think, I think they go hand in hand, honestly, Tim, because what you see is in the Supreme Court, you know, as I think you guys alluded to a second, a second ago, um, I can never say the word, Bra Bra Branovich. I can, Branovich. Yeah. In terms of, the court has said, you know, well, we can stop gerrymandering if it's based on racial uh, animus. But if it's just politics, then no, we, you know, you can do that. 
Um, but they're, the idea of those, I think those things go hand in hand now as the demographic makeup of the United States yeah. is beginning to change. So yeah, I do think that the idea of gerrymandering, I, I don't think students would do well to include gerrymandering when researching this topic, because I do believe that is also a, a present day issue. Well, I, I can't help think about the term conflict with the consensus, because it is one of the few issues that Republicans and Democrats agree on, and that is the necessity for uh, election and voter uh, reform. Uh, yet then you get, so there's the consensus, then you get the conflict and they're about as far apart as, as one can get. So Professor Williams, what, what are your thoughts about that? What is What has brought about this issue, which really, and I think Professor Moore says it, it's it, and I think we all agree for a long time in our history, it's a it's not an issue. It's it's a dead issue. We don't see a, a lot of action stuff, but suddenly now it's at the forefront of our national com conversation. Is it as Professor Moore says? Is it is it you know predominantly about race? Yeah, I think it's about race and it's about political power, and it's also the fact that um, <laughs> we we have been a liberal democracy for a little over fifty years, and. 30 of those years have seen the widening between uh, income inequality. We've seen a change in our economy. And to get to Chris's point, you know, I don't think either party has done enough to respond to the real changes that a lot of Americans are facing. And but when you just look at the when you just look at the political map, if you're a Democrat, you think, well, 95% of African Americans vote with us, and a large segment of Hispanic or Latinx voters. We we get them to the polls, we win. And Republicans see the exact opposite. So there is this very kind of political counting the votes thing. And, and we know that, you know, it was I think 24 hours after Shelby that Texas was putting in its first voter ID law. I mean, this people were waiting for this to happen. And it has partly to do with race, it has partly to do with politics, but I, again, I think it's partly to do with, we are a relatively young democracy. We're trying to figure out, like, how do we all sort of live together in a liberal democracy where we're all going to have a real equal chance to have a say? Because for most of our history, we just haven't lived in that place. We've lived in a place where only some of us have had a say. And now we're dealing, I think, with the, uh, um, you know, how to make it work when, when all of us are doing that. Well, I, I wish we had more time, but I do want students to think about, because it is part of the national conversation, and information is key here uh, in that conversation. When we look at the way that states, predominantly states right now, uh, the national government, obviously, to a certain degree, on regulation of voter fraud, there's like five categories that we look at. Uh, there. And that is voting list maintenance. All right. And we know that some states are dealing with that by purging voting lists. All right. And students, so that's something to look at is should we have voting lists? I mean, does it matter whether or not you choose to vote? I, I And I, I'll be honest, I'm having a brain fart here. I can't remember a state recently just passed a law that if you don't vote for two consecutive elections, you will be removed from the voting list uh, there. And I think, you know, I think, David, that was Florida, I think. I could be wrong, but I think it might have been Florida. Yeah, OK. Uh, you have signature requirements, which I personally don't have a problem with uh, there. But there are details. And this would take lawyers to explain some of the details there. But students think about that there as far as a, a source of, of, of fraud. Uh, witness requirements, and this is something that predominantly deals with the elderly, you know, uh, who are going to have, you know, uh, you know, vote differently than actually going into a polling station and turning the vote. But uh, uh, witness requirements, a few states have requirements and some severe requirements on who can witness and how that is done. Uh, one big issue is ballot collection laws. Uh, only one state. And this is interesting, only one state, all right, requires that only the person voting can turn in their ballot. 49 states allow others to turn in somebody else's ballots. 
there under, again, certain regulations and stuff, but that's partly how states are trying to fight fraud. And then, of course, probably the most controversial, I don't know why. And this is probably where I know I'm very separate from maybe Professor Williams. I don't get the problem with voter ID law as long, and there's my caveat, as long as the IDs are broadened to encompass different forms of ID based upon the diversity of uh, your society or your community. Now, I know what states are doing is they're not doing that. Yeah. Uh, there. So, Mike, yeah. go ahead. That's a pretty big however. It's like, I'm okay with... Uh... I'm okay with the voter ID as long as we get rid of the federal system and Congress says that all these things can be counted. I mean, you know, like Texas, Texas, you can use your concealed weapon ID, but you can't use a student ID, right? And I know you know this, David. I mean, it's like there's 11% of US citizens, about 21 million who don't have a government ID, and 25% of African Americans don't versus 8% of whites. And, and um, I, I think you can't look at that raw data and, and you may be right, maybe there is a type of, of ID that if it were accessible to everyone and it was easy to get, um, you know, 175 bucks to maybe the four of us is not a lot to spend in transportation, travel, getting a birth certificate. But for some families, 175 bucks, they just don't have it to go get, to go get an ID so they can vote in an election. But Mike, this is where this is where interest group involvement and the federal system <laughs> uh, can help us out. Uh, we can, you know, there's organizations up out there that can actively organize and push to make sure, all right, that everybody who has to have, you know, that all people they need an ID. There's organizations and fundraising to make sure that can be, you know, can happen. And if that is done you diminish that as a barrier. Oh my gosh. It's like, this is the right to vote and you want to give it to churches and- It's to not a right to vote. You, we started this whole thing off with it's not a right to vote. Yeah, you're right with that. I'm not going to- So my question would be then, David, and um, why, why did states start, and uh, for students watching, Crawford versus Marion County Board of Election, or Marion County Board of Election versus Crawford was like the first- case i know this because it was right on my in my backyard uh in, in dealing with voting rights i was voter id and the court takes a they punt kind of on their decision because of the people that brought the challenge um why do we need voter id laws why are we because they're they're a relatively new thing and if we know as we've already established voter fraud has been to next to nothing right why do we need voter ID laws? If there really was no voter fraud prior, what's the purpose of having a voter ID law in, in the modern sense? Because it's a political problem. It's a practical problem. And there is a, a very easy way to deal with this. And I'm trying to think of the, uh, uh, help me out, Mike, you know, when, when we look at suspect class and we look at the, the scrutiny areas, there's this, this standard of, of the least Help me out here. I'm having a. I'm having another. You know, discreet and insular minorities. No, you know, the least um, least restrictive. Least, least restrictive, oh, yeah, least restrictive uh, means approach. Yeah. And so, Chris, I agree with you. I think we're all there. That th this really is, you know, of zero 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 zero. I mean, I don't know how many zeros you need before the one percentage of voter fraud. But if there's a perception, a political perception out there is a problem, and we have a way to deal with that perception by passing voter ID laws and, but making sure that we have the supports and the support systems are out there. You know dang well, Chris, and it had a lot to do with 2020 uh, election. If it weren't for the interest groups for voting rights amongst various groups out there who did a hell of a job getting voting turnout up to a rate that we have not seen in a very long time, the outcome of the 2020 election would have been much different. And so my argument is rather than yell and debate, okay, fine, you want voter ID, we push for as reasonable and as fair as voter ID as we can get. And that is, as Mike says, a, a student ID is equal to an NRA ID. Uh, we find out the way to get elderly people, those groups to get ID. And there are interest groups to make sure that can happen. It, and let's it, do that yeah. and, and fight the real fight, which is about the biggest problem of what's happening in the states 
is the control over state actors in voting. And that is secretaries of states, all right, and those who run elections locally, as I'm sure you've all read about what happened in Western Colorado and what this you know voting precinct person did they broke into the building and stole data and and she was in charge of the thing and i'm sorry i'm, I'm really you know you know balkanizing this uh you know the, this whole story but if you haven't read about western colorado uh and what's happened there you know that's the big issue to me voter id is a minor issue that can be dealt with you know, uh, uh, there. So that I guess, Chris, that that's my response. Right. I, I understand what you're saying, but in, in by saying that, though, what you're doing is you're kowtowing to their argument that is needed in the first place. And Mike already has a He's elaborated on the idea that you know you have certain segments of society. This puts an undue burden on them, and 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 if we can get away from that undue burden, maybe. But again, it's a policy in search of a problem and going back to what you were reading off david and it kind of alluded to it i think what's most troubling to me out of all this mess that we're in right now is now you see state laws taking the ability uh away from secretaries of states to certify, to certify to certify elections more, that is what is more disturbing and taking this ability to certify those away from them to and giving it to a state legislature because of maybe they don't like the outcome that and is that's, and that's the fight we should be fighting i just don't think voter id because i think there's a way to deal with it all right uh you know kind of thing and so uh we have one of our four b's and we've always decided that one for all all for one uh, uh that has a, a another meeting here so i'm gonna I defer to Professor Moore and Williams. Do you have any final thoughts on this question that you want students uh, or teachers to think about? Uh, no, I I don't. I'm going <laughs> to defer. I'm going to defer to Mike. Mike, final thoughts on what yeah. uh, teachers and students? Well, I just want to go to, to back what Tim said a little while ago about maybe this has to do with race, and just comment that. Uh, you, you can see students that there's a lot of different opinions that we're all pretty passionate about this in different ways. Um, and we hope that you are as well. But I think that David's point about, well, maybe we can, if we, if everyone has an ID, it gets rid of, it's a perception problem. I would have you think about Tim's issue about his point about race. And if the real issue is not about a voter ID, if the real issue is who do we think America belongs to? What do we think America looks like? Um, is making voter ID more accessible going to get rid of that issue? Because again, if we are a relatively young democracy that is becoming less white, more diverse, um, that's our that's our future. Um, and that to me seems like that's what this really is about. This is not about the voter ID. It's about a national identity question that I think Tim put his finger on. And I'm not sure if any legislation in the world is going to help us solve that question. I think it's a much deeper conversation. Professor Kavanaugh, final thoughts. Um, I'll just tell students to take a look at uh, Chief Justice Roberts' opinion in Shelby County and then look at Justice Ginsburg's dissent, uh, lay those side by side to see what those legal arguments were in that case in terms of where we were then and where we are now. And uh, students and teachers, uh, I you know I get to the core of whether or not somehow, some way, Congress uh, or the courts need to articulate as clear as possible that voting is a fundamental right and uh, to put some muscle behind that. Uh, if not, then it is uh, kind of you know just flopping out there as this notion of a privilege. And I would concur with uh, Professor Kavanaugh. You've got to make sure you're very familiar with Shelby versus Holder and Baranovich versus the Democratic National Committee, as well as the key cases of the 1960s that dealt with voting rights. It's, you know, and again, they dealt with gerrymandering. I'm glad Professor Moore brought that up because that's another issue that we really, you know, this question didn't really lead us lead us that way. Uh, but uh, that you really need to get into this whole process of elections. We are we are an exception once again. 
on how we run elections vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, the democratic world, if we want to label it that way. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it's amusing, but also very frustrating. So until next time, uh, hope we hopefully are going to be dealing with uh, unit two, uh, question two, when we next uh, see each other. But until that time, uh, the uh, Major League Baseball playoffs are coming off. Congratulations to the Milwaukee uh, Bucks, and uh, let's hope that there's a big earthquake in San Francisco. Oh, the, the Bucks quickly. already won the championship. You mean the Brewers? <laughs> Did I say the Milwaukee Bucks? <laughs> All right, the Milwaukee Brewers. See, I told you they're the dominant. It doesn't matter. Bucks, Packers, whatever it is. But earthquake in San Francisco. Hopefully, it's coming pretty soon. Until then, bye bye, bye bonds, peace, love, younger talkers.